Well, good morning, El Paso Bible Church. Uh, welcome to our service this morning, uh, really our message this morning. This is the, the, what we're limited to currently. I would like to mention that within the governor's guidelines, we are planning on having a live service on May 10th. It will be a service only, and there will be some differences and some restrictions. There will be no Sunday school hour, no children's church, uh, and no nursery. Uh, but within the governor's guidelines, uh, we are going to go ahead and try to have a live face-to-face -face service on that Sunday. And you can find out some more information about those guidelines through the governor's office here in the state of Texas. Um, we're going to continue on in our series in John, and that takes us to John chapter 21. Uh, you'll remember that this is now at the portion of the Gospel of John, uh, where John is recording Jesus, the risen Savior. He is risen, is he not? He is risen indeed. And John is recording how he is manifesting himself to his disciples in this new glorified body, uh, in this transition that has taken place from him being with them every moment, uh, feeding them with his hands, so to speak, hand-feeding them information, hand-feeding them food, hand-feeding them all the things that they need, uh, standing in between them and any dangers that may, they may encounter in their ministries on the earth. Uh, things have, have changed. But you remember that, that the purpose statement that we talked about in John chapter 20, right at the end, verse 30 and 31, uh, gave us information right about John's purpose in writing. And that was so that we who had not seen those events uh, could believe. And that's not necessarily only referring to the, the one-time event of what we call justification, where you go from not believing in Jesus for eternal life and believing in Jesus for eternal life. Uh, but there is more information that we learn throughout of our lives that we are not eyewitnessing generally, uh, that we can believe about Jesus. That's very important for us to achieve the purpose that he has for us in this life. And so that's John's purpose, that we would have eternal life, life of that quality. Not just that we would receive it, but that we would have it and live it throughout this life on this earth. And that we would know more about the one in whom we have believed. Uh, the term that John records for that here in these last few chapters is normally translated something like manifest, to make something stunningly crystalline clear, uh, to make an indelible impression on someone's memory, uh, to make it something that is undeniable, something that is crystalline clear in their mind. Shining forth is the kind of the literal way of describing it, something that, that smacks you in the face, that is so bright, like sun on a windshield coming out of the grocery store here in El Paso in June or something like that. Uh, and he's revealing himself. He's manifesting himself. He is building memories that they have that are going to come into play in their ministries throughout their lives. And he's revealing himself in ways that he had not done before. You know, it's a strange thing uh, to consider because in this world, the, the, the access that we have to very superficial information about people is very far-reaching. We, we believe and understand that we have close relationships with people that we call friends that we may not have seen in years, uh, may not even recognize anymore on the street uh, because their profile no, ma no longer matches their profile pic. Uh, we just don't know. And so we have a substitute form of relationships sometimes, uh, many times, uh, when we're talking about our relationships with people. And we feel, uh, we impute to ourselves, we credit to ourselves a deeper, more intimate knowledge of these people uh, than we actually have. And what Jesus wants is for these people to have actual knowledge and not a substitute. He doesn't want them to be satisfied merely with the memories that they had had of his ministry previously, but he wants them to understand some new lessons when he's manifesting himself to them. Uh, in other words, like knowing what kind of memes make certain friends chuckle, that, that's, eh, that's kind of knowing something about somebody. But it is not a good substitute for knowing the person. Knowing a person, too, is dependent on how much they choose to manifest to you. You hear people say this, well, I've known him for years, but I never... Uh, really knew him. I never knew that about him. Uh, and, and that's because that individual chose not to manifest a certain quality or a certain characteristic uh, about themselves to anybody. And most people choose, if they're given the choice, they choose not to manifest themselves too much. Uh, they, they choose to keep much of their information, their personal information, extremely private. Now, Jesus is not most people. Jesus is not most people. 
he makes extended and repeated efforts to manifest himself to his disciples. And so John begins with this section with a repetition of that term, manifest. Fanerao, to shine forth. And it means he's emphasizing that activity. He says it two times at the beginning. He says it one time at the end of this passage. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 21, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. See, the, the two times that you're saying, this is what this, this phrasing makes this topic uh, primary in this section of Scripture. So he's manifesting himself again. He's done it before, he's doing it again, and he does it this way. Simon Peter and faithful Thomas, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Uh, I guess those were the least favorite ones. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure why they don't have names, but there are about seven of these guys, right, as I read it. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So I don't know if this was a statement of exasperation or boredom of, or of necessity from Peter, but he takes the lead and he says, I'm, I'm going to go fishing. Now, when you say that, uh, now don't, don't take this the wrong way. That might be because your mother-in-law is coming over. Now, that might be because somebody that you don't want to see is going to be coming and staying for an extended visit. So you had to uh, go fishing. I'm going to go fishing. I've gone. I'm done. I'm done with this day. Um, I might say that I've, I'm going to deer camp. I'm going hunting. Something like that. I'm not much of a, of a fisherman. Uh, I don't really like getting my feet wet. Uh, I don't like slime. I don't, I don't like fishing all that much. I don't really like to eat fish either. Uh, but this is what Peter did. But you need to understand that this is his profession. Uh, at least it was a trade that he had been trained in. Uh, for instance, my, my trade that I had been trained in is, is woodworking. Uh, it's not one that I'm currently engaged in, but it is certainly in my back pocket. It's something that I have skill in, uh, more than certainly more than most people that engage in that trade. And so when I have time or inclination, that's kind of what I'm drawn to do. When I, when I don't know what else to do, I go make some sawdust. And that's what Peter, I think, is doing here. He's got some time on his hands, and he may as well make a little bit of money here. Uh, I think that's his intent. He's not really just going out looking for breakfast. He's taking a few moments of, of downtime, it seems like, and exercising his profession. So everybody decides we're going to go. And so this is a pretty big crowd in this boat. Seven people in these types of boats was a lot of people. They weren't huge. And so they're going out to use time that they had wisely, productively. Uh, and I, really, let's, let's be clear. Some people would criticize me for saying this. Um, and I am highly critical of a lot of the, the orders that we are existing under right now. And I do not make apology for that, so please don't ask me to do so. Uh, but I hope that, as you have in some measure probably been limiting your movements and limiting the amount of exposure to other people that you've had during this time, uh, that you have not just focused on watching the news, because that is nearly a death sentence after a certain amount of time. I mean, mentally, you are going to kill brain cells doing that. I hope that you have taken the time to exercise some skills that you have or learn some new skills that you uh, don't have yet but would like to have had, uh, that you've used your time productively and wisely in a way that has long-lasting ramifications that you can take with you uh, from this time period where it's kind of forced upon you and use that to good effect in the future. So I think that's what Peter is doing. He doesn't have anything else to do, so he's going to use his time wisely. See, I'm not a fisherman. You know, but this is a rough night. See, when I do this, when I go and I decide I just need to make something out of wood, I need to use this time that I have, I usually end up with a pile of sawdust on the floor and something standing there. But when you're a fisherman, uh, it's pretty simple, uh, you know, to go out at night and not catch anything, I guess. And that's what he's done. That's not their expectation. They usually know where the fish are, when they're going to bite, and how to catch them. But in this case, he says, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will come with you. And this is a terrible party uh, because they went out and got into the boat. And that night, all night, hours and hours and hours, they caught nothing. Uh, but there is a reason they call it fishing and not catching. 
Uh, hunters have the same thing. We call it hunting, not shooting. Uh, you're not guaranteed the result. Uh, even if you go to one of these these uh, shooting ranges with live animals, is a lot of what the hunting ranches are here in Texas, uh, and they parade the deer in front of you until you, sh you, you still are not actually guaranteed uh, a result. But in this case, this is a wild environment. Uh, the, the fish, they had an expectation that the fish would be biting. Uh, the, well, not biting. They're catching them in a net. There's no bait involved. Uh, they would, the, but that they would catch fish. Uh, they're professionals. Uh, and they probably haven't had many nights where they went out and caught nothing in their lives. But they did this night. They don't catch a single thing. Uh, they don't catch enough for breakfast. Uh, they don't catch enough for their immediate needs, much less for any pocket money. Now, oh, let's be honest, it's a strange part of the world. Unique. Should we say unique? We shouldn't say strange. We, we should say unique. It's a unique part of the world in which people eat grilled fish for breakfast. Now, if you eat grilled fish for breakfast, don't take this as a criticism. It's not a moral judgment, but it is weird. Uh, grilled fish for breakfast, and we're going to see that they do that. It's right up there with somebody who gets really, really thirsty. They go out and run a half marathon, and then they get done and, and want to drink milk. I mean, that doesn't happen. Let's not be uh, unfair and say that that's normal. That, that's not normal. Uh, and eating fish for breakfast is not normal, but we're going to see that. Most of us don't understand these people, and that's okay. And they're, hopefully they're okay with that, not being understood. But it says in verse 4, when the day was now breaking, so they've been there all night, it's now dawn. The day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now we find out later that they're about 100 yards out. Uh, and so it could just be an eyesight issue. It could be a supernatural veiling. You know, when we saw Mary Magdalene, she didn't recognize Jesus either. That could have been the, the tears in her eyes or the mental stress that she was under. It could also have been for a purpose that it was supernatural. Uh, that Jesus had something to teach them by creating a moment of recognition in, the, in this context. So they don't recognize him. Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, they've seen him before. Uh, Thomas has seen him in a very special way. And by his own request, Jesus came specially for him, remember. They've seen him since he's risen. Verse 5 says this, So Jesus said to them, Children, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. Now, there are very few people presently alive on this earth that are qualified to call me child. Far fewer than I get to call child. Uh, very, very few people. It's not normal, and I don't know if that's intended here, but certainly sometimes I say this to people. I call them Skippy. And when I call somebody Skippy, I'm, I'm indicating to them that they need to learn a lesson and that they need to be humble enough to learn it and that they need to change what they're doing. That's generally what, what happens. And some people do this to me. That's, that's not totally abnormal. But there are a few people that would just out of the blue, me not knowing who they are, just go, hey, child. It just doesn't happen. Children, you don't have any fish. You guys need some experience. You guys need to learn a lesson. You need to grow up a little bit here, children. You need to learn something. Now, they've been working all night. They're professionals, grown up in a family of professionals, fishermen, as we are to understand it. And, of course, their answer is, no, we don't have any fish. Probably a little bit exasperated uh, about not having fish. Probably they exacerbated their exasperation. Those words are very similar sounding when you say them too fast. Made their exasperation worse. They, they, probably the request, if I hope I'm not projecting too much of my own response here, but that definitely made their exasperation worse, being called to attention by somebody standing on the shore. Uh, hey, you guys, I can see from here your boat is empty. You don't have any fish in there. So here was what to do, children. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. Cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. You'll, you'll find some fish if you do that. What? Seven fishermen in the boat, working hard all night. I can virtually guarantee you that these seven fishermen had not spent all night in that boat, casting the net singly and, and solely on the left 
side of the boat. And they still don't know who this guy is. They do not know him. They know that he has called them uh, children. Uh, but they do it anyway. One more time. One more time, they're going to cast the net. They're getting ready to be done. Dawn, dawn is too late. They're getting ready to be done, but they cast the net one more time. And I think that might be if only so that they could say, hey, listen, guy, uh, we're not children. See, we're going to cast this net over here. And we're still going to catch no fish because we've cast it on that side of the boat. We cast it on that side of the boat. We cast it behind the boat. Uh, we have sung here fishy fishy a few times. We have done everything we know how to do to catch these fish. And we haven't caught any all night. To so cast your net on the other side of the boat, on the right side. And you will find some or you'll find a catch. So they cast. And then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Where had the fish been hiding? We don't, we don't know. They were clearly in, in the water. It is possible, of course, that Jesus merely spoke them into existence as he had done at the very beginning of creation, as he had been the agent of creation. It is possible that he merely spoke the fish into the net. I'm not going to discount that. Uh, but it is amazing. It is a miracle either way how that happened. The, the net is heavy, and they can't draw it in because of so many fish in it. Verse 7 says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, I don't, only Peter, it is the Lord. That's Jesus over there. He hasn't been with us here in the last few moments, but he's here now. He's over on the shore <laughs> So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now that sounds a little backwards to me. In our culture, often we see people taking clothes off to get into the water. Certainly shoes. I, I don't know how anybody swims with shoes on. I guess it happens. But he puts his cloak on. So I guess he doesn't come out of the water in some form of, of undress that would be socially unacceptable. He puts his clothes on and goes and, and swims back to the shore. He threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Now that, that's way worse than dragging an anchor, as far as I can tell. I mean, that is a lot of drag. So they came. I mean, they could do it. There were six of them left in the boat. Uh, but they are having a, a little bit of difficulty with this, and dragging these fish behind him. And they come the long way, but they're bringing the fish. And Jesus, of course, is already there. Verse 9 says this, So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. You know, it may just be one of the cooler little side benefits of being, you know, the Son of God. Uh, but it seems like uh, his charcoal is ready to cook on immediately. Like he just kind of has it. Psh, it's there. See, I don't think anybody would cook on propane if they could do that. Despite my, you know, uh, children who love the, the King of the Hill reference, propane and propane accessories. I don't believe that anybody would choose that uh, to grill over if it was as easy as using his propane. Uh, and that's what Jesus has. He can turn uh, charcoal into uh, propane, essentially, here. Just flip it on. Get it ready to go. Uh, you know, it's the little things. Make it special. And there are fish placed out on it. The fire is already laid. It's already ready to go, and the fish are placed on it and bread. Bring some of your fish. Put it on here. And then nobody stops to ask where Jesus got his fish. I don't think you have to ask him. If he can speak them into the net, he can speak them onto the grill. But Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Take some of the fish out of there. You've got a few to spare. Let's go ahead and have a good breakfast here. Um, Peter, or maybe all of them together, gets to counting. There's 153 large fish in this net. Uh, more fish than I would catch in 100 lifetimes. I mean, partly because I don't go fishing. But I, I get skunked virtually every time I go. That's why I don't go. Um, but certainly more than they needed for their breakfast. One fish would probably have fed all of them of, of a large one. But more than that, it's likely enough to provide for their financial needs for a good measure of time. 20-something fish per person here. Just a few more verses here that we're going to cover today. 
There were so many. The net was not torn even. Another supernatural event. But Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Of course, they were right there now. They could, they could see him. Come and have breakfast. I want to tell you something. I love breakfast. Uh, we, we grow eggs in our backyard. Well, we don't grow them. We grow the chickens. The chickens lay the eggs. Uh, we produce bacon in our backyard. And we produce honey in our backyard. And so my, my idea of the perfect breakfast is to have two or three or four fried eggs with some homegrown bacon fried up just right with raw honey and the honeycomb spread on a sourdough biscuit with strong coffee. And there's no combination in the kitchen that smells quite the same. Certainly none that smells exactly better. It might smell different. Barbecue is a close second. Smoked sausage is awfully good. But that breakfast combo, when it is ready and on the table, is one of the best smells I can think of. I also can't imagine having fish for breakfast. I know I mentioned that earlier. <laughs> but we have to extrapolate, right? When Jesus offers his friends fresh fish and bread over a charcoal fire on the, on the beach... That's special. Uh, I think that they smelled essentially the same sensory perception that I get from my homemade eggs and bacon with homemade biscuits and raw honeycomb and strong coffee is what they were smelling as soon as they got on the beach and were smelling this grilled fish and probably the, the toasted bread, the warmed up bread anyway. So I can't empathize with people feeling like that about fish, but I know that that... That is likely what is happening here, that their, their senses are being overwhelmed just by the wonderfulness of this smell of breakfast. And, and grilling anything does smell good. It's just the fish for breakfast thing. That's the best breakfast they could imagine. He says he took the bread and he gave it to them. And the fish likewise. He took the bread and the fish and he gave it to them. And, and John repeats his, his phrasing, this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, what you and I, he's not just belaboring the point. He's not nagging anybody, but he is making it very, very clear that if you were not learning the lesson from these events about Jesus manifesting something to his disciples, then you have missed the point of the story. It is not just a cool story about the nets not breaking with 153 large fish in it. It is about what that event manifested, made clear, made an indelible mental impression in the memories of the disciples, the lesson that it taught them, and how it manifested Jesus to his own disciples. And that, that, that means that there's an application. Now, we don't just tell the story, we, we're bad about that sometimes, because Jesus does some really cool stuff. And sometimes the application is, oh, that was really great. That was really awesome. Jesus is incredible. Jesus is incredible. This is really awesome. And it is very cool. And here's why. Because of the lesson that it teaches us. What we call the application. And I think if I had to, to kind of sum that up. Get it down to kind of the bare minimum. Jesus is teaching them. Despite how things have changed. Despite how your life feels different. Uh, despite how you, you may be tempted to go back and do some mundane things that you are doing. Maybe it's a habit of yours. Maybe it's a thing that you do to relax. You go and fish. Uh, there is no success in any endeavor for a disciple apart from simple obedience to Jesus. There is no success in any endeavor for a disciple of Jesus without simple obedience to Jesus. There's no success. That's what they experienced. They were operating in a mundane task that they were proficient at. Going out, spending all night fishing. Possibly trying to meet their own financial needs in an interim time that may have been a little bit of a hardship. You and I know how that feels. Uh, things changed for them. That's not a current feeling for them, but it's certainly in my past history. I know exactly how it feels. No success in any endeavor for the disciple without simple obedience. Now that tells me something. That means that success is not necessarily defined by results. Now we, 
We like results. We want results. Jesus wants results, but what he wants first is simple obedience. And these guys had a track record of obeying. For the most part, they, had, they would not have been selected to take this ministry into the world for the rest of their lives if they did not have a track record of obedience. But Jesus is teaching them, after this transition, when I'm going to ascend to the Father and I'm manifesting myself to you in the interim and I'm not going to be here feeding you with my hands, protecting you with my hands, explaining my words directly to you with my mouth, physically, this relationship has changed. That success is impossible without simple obedience to Jesus. Success is not defined by the result. Success is determined and defined by simple obedience. Uh, things had changed in their relationship to Jesus, and for their entire lifetimes, they would not change back. So this is a lesson that they would take with them. At least on the surface, he was not physically with them all the time. He was not, they were not walking in his footsteps. They could not track him by his tracks in the sand. He was not explaining as they went anymore. He was not directly protecting and providing for them physically moment by moment. Wasn't doing that anymore. And the lesson, too, is this. Even when you cannot see his face, success is dependent on simple obedience. So it's impossible. Success in any endeavor for the disciple of Jesus is impossible without simple obedience. Even when you can't see his face, even when you have a hard time recognizing where he is in any circumstance, you can simply obey and know that that is enough to be successful. Even when it seems a mundane effort, even when it seems a mundane objective or goal, such as professional fishermen going out to fish. I could give you uh, examples you know, of faithfully completing mundane tasks, but all of us kind of intuitively know they may be different for you or for me. But even when the goal is mundane or the effort is mundane, even when it's something you've been doing all day, every day for your entire life, something you could do with both hands tied behind your back in a blindfold, you could, you could achieve, there is still the requirement that in each decision that we make, that, that we simply obey Jesus. We positively and simply obey Him. Notice they didn't ask why. Uh, objectively, they didn't even know who Jesus was. They didn't recognize him at first. And when he said to them, throw your nets over the right side, they just did it. And I think that particular kind of obedience yields the greatest possible successes. When we don't ask why. Does, does God get mad when you ask why? No. Doesn't mean he's going to answer either. He doesn't get mad. He is not angry at you for that. You can ask. He just doesn't necessarily have to answer. And there is a special blessing for you and for me when we simply obey without doing it, as these guys did. Simple obedience to Jesus makes a difference between success and failure. And it brings blessings in your life that will come no other way. Simple obedience to Jesus brings blessings in your life that will come no other way. And that's all for this morning. And we'll see you next time.